何の疑問も抱かずただ命令に従うだけの奴隷が見るに耐えなかった俺はガキの頃からずっとミカサお前が大嫌いだった<笑>And also the brutality that would be demanded of her to survive. What Aaron told her in this moment shaped her whole character. She had to choose be the prey or fight back against the cruelty of the world and become the predator. She chose not to stay ignorant of what was around her and what she needed to do to live. She viewed Aaron as a beacon of beauty because, as he urged her to take action and wrap the iconic scarf around her, he taught her how to fight, how to live. There's nothing further removed from freedom than ignorance. These are the words Aaron speaks to Mikasa during the infamous table scene. In retrospect, Aaron was clearly lying to her in order to distance himself from her, but what makes this situation interesting for me is that Aaron is completely correct when he calls her out on this. Mikasa's obsession with Aaron causes her to grow ignorance of the world around her, and in hindsight, the fact that what Aaron tells her is a lie only serves to prove this. When she restrains Armin after he attempts to attack Eren, or when she threatens to kill Ymir if she gets in the way of saving Eren, she isn't being manipulated by her Ackerman blood. No, Mikasa convinces herself that Eren is a symbol of beauty, and then, of her own free will, chooses to live her life like his slave. We see this narrow minded worldview at play during the chaotic confrontation between Historia and Mikasa in the Clash of Titans arc. After Historia begs her not to kill Ymir and tells her that Ymir has no choice but to follow Reiner and Bertholdt, She gives a cold and apathetic response. There are only so many lives I can value, and I decided who those people were six years ago. So you shouldn't try to ask for my pity, because right now I don't have time to spare or room in my heart. This quote from Mikasa truly speaks for itself, and it tells the story of a girl who refuses to acknowledge the worth in anything but the person that she loves. Additionally, I feel it's important to analyze a lesser talked about piece of Mikasa's identity in her relationship with the Azuma Vitos. At this point, we all know this, but Attack on Titan is a story that is all about perspective. How exactly do we view the world around us and its nuances, and why? So, I want to take a look at the Azuma Vito subplot from the point of view of Mikasa. Upon first meeting Kiyomi, Mikasa clearly isn't very enthusiastic about reuniting with her long lost relatives. And only even shows them the brand on her arm after being urged onto by Eren. Kiyomi is moved by this, and she praises Mikasa and her mother, and even offers to provide her a home in Hizuru. However, behind this hospitality, Mikasa sees the ugliness and greed within her, and even believes that she's only pretending to be this kind because she's after the valuable resources within Paradise, that she wouldn't have even talked to the Eldians if not for that. But while this ugliness within Kiyomi certainly exists, This conception of her as someone who is fueled purely by greed falls apart pretty quickly once you start to consider a couple facts. Firstly, Kiyomi decided to reach out to Mikasa before even learning about the Ice Burst Stone. On top of this, the first time we are introduced to her is when she takes the blame for Udo accidentally spilling some wine on her kimono, when she literally has nothing to gain from protecting him like this. It becomes apparent that she really does care about the Eldians. Even after Eren escapes from his jail cell and Kiyomi realizes that she and the rest of her clan on the island are pretty much helpless, she still wishes to protect Mikasa. No matter how you look at it, Kiyomi's pride in her clan and her love for Mikasa undeniably run deeper than her greed, 
and yet, when she offers to protect her from the conflict, Mikasa insults her and basically tells her to piss off. There is beauty within this cruel world, and Kiyomi's kindness and fondness for Mikasa is unmistakably a part of that beauty. However, Mikasa disregards this and simply views Kiyomi as an avaricious and materialistic liar. Mikasa is ignorant. This is the result of her obsession with Eren, and it's exactly why she's precisely what he tells her she is, a slave. If the furthest thing from freedom is ignorance, then Mikasa's toxic love for Eren has shackled her. Ymir was quite possibly the character in Attack on Titan who experienced the cruelty of the world the most. The two main things to take away from her backstory are her longing for freedom and her desperation for love. There's no way to know for sure exactly why Ymir freed those pigs 2000 years ago, but to me, it feels like she wanted to live vicariously through them, as if to say that if she could, of her own free will, give these animals the freedom she yearned for, then that would mean that Ymir herself was free. However, this couldn't be further off from the truth, as this act only brought a new depth of hellish torment into her life. So, Ymir chooses to trample the world with Eren. Having been a slave for the last 2000 years, it's understandable that she would want to take the chance that Eren gives her to reclaim the life and freedom that was unjustly stolen from her, and express all the bottled up emotions she had been holding onto. But as she watches the result of her decision, not once does she seem to have any sort of reaction. Indeed, by any definition, Ymir's life is one that isn't even worth living, and going through with the rumbling was never going to change that. Even her titan takes the form of a pig, which is a cruel irony. Just like an animal trapped in a pen, Ymir herself is still so far from freedom. Responding to the cruelty of the world with your own cruelty won't make the pain go away. And because of this, I think it's pretty reasonable that Ymir would instead, like Mikasa, seek out something that she considers to be beautiful in an attempt to distract herself from the pain and forget about it. So because this world is such a harsh and trying place, you must be sure to grow up to be someone everyone loves. Ymir loved Carl Fritz. This at first seems like a preposterous statement, and truthfully it is. The idea of loving the singular source of all the problems in your life is just nonsensical. But the fact that it's so devoid of reason makes it all the more intriguing as to why she would do something so strange. What could possibly drive someone to think something so plainly illogical? Powerlessness. Powerlessness to do anything. Powerlessness to change anything. As I said earlier, even after going through with the rumbling, Ymir was not happy. Nothing changed. No, Ymir's powerlessness isn't her inability to impose her will upon the world but her inability to fix her own broken heart, and to set herself free. There is beauty within this cruel world, and for Ymir, finding this beauty was a must in order for her to go on living. She was forced to adapt to her hellish environment. However, Ymir had nothing. Her very existence was the property of someone else, but as she walked through the streets of her raised village, she saw something amazing. Love. And what's so amazing about it in the eyes of someone like Ymir is that, as opposed to any other materialistic possession like wealth, status, or power, love isn't tangible. There's really no physical way to prove whether or not it exists in any given circumstance. A king may flaunt his boundless riches, while a slave cannot. But even a worthless slave can delude themselves into believing that they are in love. But as we all know, this too was not an acceptable solution. It couldn't make her pain go away. Likewise, after being confronted with the idea that Eren could possibly be planning something catastrophic, Mikasa would also find herself trying to run from the cruelty of the world. When Mikasa has constant headaches, it's the result of her trying to ignore the cruelty of the world. That is, that she doesn't want to accept that Eren could be that cruelty, or that she would have to kill him to put a stop to it. Though, before I talk any more about her headaches, I want to take a look at Mikasa's signature scarf, and what exactly it represents in the story of Attack on Titan. This involves Luis, an honestly unimportant character in the grand scheme of things, but someone who is useful as a short-term foil for Mikasa. After her parents are killed in Chapter 6, 
Mikasa thinks to herself that a world without them would be too cold for her, and that she needs their warmth in order to live. Then, Eren wraps the scarf around her, literally and metaphorically giving her the warmth she needs in her life. And the fact that she keeps it with her at all times is symbolic of her desperate need for Eren. Now, Luis has a very similar view towards Mikasa as Mikasa does to Eren, as after being saved by her, Luis learned that she needed to win in order to live and fight in order to win. She clearly adores Mikasa as well, wanting to sleep in the same cell as her, and even admitting that she joined the survey corpse in the first place to get closer to her, and the fact that she took the scarf from her is proof of this. And all of this becomes painfully ironic when Mikasa tells her to be quiet and warns her of the dangers of blindly obsessing over someone else, and Luis soon dies, because she acts almost identically to how Mikasa used to. And as she moves her arms into the survey corp salute, you can see in Mikasa's eyes that she's reminded of herself. I've already talked about Mikasa, and the way her fascination with Eren makes her ignorant towards some of the beauty in the world and how she treats Kiyomi, but now, I'm going to be talking about how this obsession causes her to grow ignorant towards some of the cruelty in the world, and how she tries not to acknowledge its existence. To see an example of this, you can look no further than the 6th chapter, or rather, compare the events of this chapter to the flashbacks Mikasa has of them when she's having headaches. Post time skip, Eren is portrayed as much more terrifying and cruel in Mikasa's memories than before. She finds herself second guessing whether Eren has always really been a kind boy, or if there had been something more sinister within him. She knows that Eren is a terrible person, and that he has realistically always had the capacity to be one, but she's in denial. After Eren goes through with the rumbling, Mikasa reflects on her time with him and the fact that no one ever realized that he could be such a monster, but she admits to herself that she has always known this, but just pretended not to see it. She admits to herself that she was ignorant. She takes the scarf off, but half-heartedly still carries it around with her, clearly symbolizing that she wants to forget about Eren, but she can't. Annie works as a foil to Mikasa for a different reason than Luis. While both of them have similarities to her, they differ in that Luis represents what Mikasa used to be and Annie possesses the self-awareness that Mikasa lacks. Throughout the events of Attack on Titan, Annie has always been someone whose subjective morality dictates how she treats the people around her. Whether she's carelessly massacring Levi's squad or trying to save Armin even when she knows she's being lured into a trap, the way Annie makes decisions is seemingly very unorthodox and complicated, but in reality, it's actually very simple. She lets Armin live because she likes him, and she kills the survey corpse because she doesn't care about them. She just does whatever it is she wants to do. Because of the abuse she endured from her adoptive father as a child, she stopped seeing any value in life, or morals, or anything, which is why she's able to squash survey corpse members the same way she steps on a bug. But something that is interesting about her and very telling of the way her mind works is that she doesn't choose to help Armin when he asks her to do it because it will make her a good person. Rather, she decides to help him when he says it will make her good for him. This is where we start to see the parallels between Mikasa and Annie, and the way they both form toxic relationships. Because all of the evil acts Annie commits on her time in Paradise Island, she does for the sake of getting home to Marley and reuniting with her father. However, the difference between Annie and Mikasa post time skip is that Annie isn't ignorant. Unlike Mikasa, she doesn't avert her eyes from the truth that her actions are detestable and that her enemies don't deserve to be violently murdered. She understands that her journey to meet back up with her father will result in more bloodshed in the world than it's worth. But she doesn't care. I have a father waiting for me. And others have people just as important to them, too. I used to not care about anything, but it's different now. I think I've committed irredeemable sins. But if it meant returning to my father, I'd do it all over again. Annie acknowledges the beauty of the world, in that she may be able to see her dad again, but also the cruelty of the world, in that she would have to take that opportunity away from others in order to have that chance. When Annie confronts Mikasa numerous times on whether or not she'll be able to kill Eren, she works so well as a foil to her. After she calls Mikasa out on the fact that she's unable to ever consider something to be more important than Eren, Annie actually doesn't escalate the situation any further, instead doing the opposite, and telling Mikasa that she fully understands how she feels. And I think that throughout the numerous conversations these two have from this point on in the story, that Annie influences Mikasa heavily, because she essentially sends the message to her that her deep love for Eren isn't an issue, but when push comes to shove, she's going to have to face the reality of the world and find a feasible way to stop him, one way or the other. Now, ironically enough, Eren viciously berating Mikasa might actually have been the kindest thing he has done since commencing his plan to carry out the rumbling, 
and this is because, while his actions were outwardly cruel, his end goal was to distance himself from Mikasa and his friends, in order to spare them from the pain of the burden that he had to carry, a pain which he had grown to be very familiar with. In a horrific way, it can be said that what he did was, in fact, something beautiful, and so too was Mikasa's response to it. I think this says a lot about the message that Attack on Titan is trying to portray with its characters, that a single thing can be both cruel and beautiful. Whether that thing is an action, a person, or the world itself, we shouldn't be ignorant of its beauty or cruelty. This is exactly what Eren wants Mikasa to do, to forget about him. However, she realizes that it's something that she just cannot do. When she puts the scarf back around her neck, it's her acknowledging that even though Eren is this great evil, she can't forget about him, and she can't stop loving him. And because she loves him, she has to kill him, and set him free from the hellish life he lives and the agonizing love that he's a slave to. Mikasa embraces both the beauty and cruelty of the world, and in doing so, she also saves Ymir, because she shows her that even though the world can make your life dreadful, and that love can be painful, sometimes it's okay to just let go and be free.